Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's webinar event, Breath of Innovation, Creating a Lung Valve Program, sponsored by Nuance. Before we begin, just a few reminders. Everyone is currently in a listen-only mode and is muted. Please submit all your questions throughout the lecture by using your question feature. It's located on your control panel. We will address all the questions at the end of the lecture. At this time, I'll hand it off to Dr. Kyle Hogarth and Dr. Bobby Tullis to get us started. Thank you all for joining. Hey, thanks for being here and the opportunity to speak for SAB. Um, I'm Bobby Tellis. I'm practicing pulmonologist, advanced bronchoscopist in Gulfport, Mississippi at Memorial Hospital. Um, Kyle? I'm Kyle Hogarth. I'm an uh, advanced bronchoscopist and run the interventional pulmonary program at the University of Chicago. And uh, always excited to talk about opportunities to grow valve programs. Uh, I think it's a, it's a key part of the arsenal of any uh, interventional based practice, but honestly, it's a key part of any arsenal for any pulmonologist who's just interested in people breathing better. So it's it's a, something that, and you know, I think Bob and I are going to explain a lot of different ways to grow your program, and in particular, using a lot of the solutions that now can be run essentially automatically, a lot of AI-driven solutions uh, to enhance what you're trying to accomplish. Yeah, so that's kind of the scope. I imagine those who, who are attending may either be doing valves themselves, interested in doing it, came out of a program that was doing it, starting in a new practice, and just saying, you know, how do I get started? And and those who may be doing it have kind of most likely have run into the same things you and I did before the introduction of AI. And so we're actually going to talk about how AI can be helpful, uh, a longer term pilot program than a short 90 day pilot that we did. And then here we are to launch. And so let's get in, into this. Um, and these are the things that we just talked about, how we can use a nuance-based product and, and in bio, and then Olympus with their select screening CT to use the spiration valves to help streamline a BLVR program. That's right. Those who are pulmonologists uh, in the group or even our thoracic surgeons who may be the attending, this is kind of known information. So what can we do after we optimize medical therapy or what kind of procedures can we proceed with that are not as aggressive as they previously once were what kind of endobronchial therapy can we proceed with you know and i think i think the thing that's fun about valves i mean you know when you talk to a lot of people that are very focused on procedural based uh practices everyone's talking about the someday you know therapeutics that we can deliver via bronchoscopes you know whether that's robotic or otherwise but you know, and that's great. It's exciting. I love the idea of the things we'll be able to do therapeutically for cancer. But long before then, we've got things now. And, you know, if you're a pulmonologist, you're interested in people breathing better, period. Right? That's one of the things that motivated you to go into this profession. And the fact that we have something with established data that is, uh, you know, both procedural based and yet dramatically improves how patients feel, you know, this is a procedure kind of built for us, it, it, literally, from the perspective of our love of, of pulmonary medicine and our love of helping people breathe better, seeing the numbers that we're up against with COPD, seeing what hyperinflation does to these people, and the fact that you have a solution for it that satisfies the procedural, you know, part of your brain and, and the pulmonary part of your brain at the same time. And I think when you talk to a lot of people, like Bobby said, you know, it's easy to say, I'm going to have a valve program. And when you start it, there's always the immediate, like, onslaught of patients that have been sort of, you know, held back, you know, by all the referring docs and they kind of send you their 10 worst people. And then, but after that immediate onslaught, the the trickle, it goes down to a trickle pretty quickly. Um, and I think a lot of that is it's not well understood, everybody that should be evaluated, but also there are tons of patients within your system that already have data that indicates they'd be a candidate for valves and you just don't know it if you could find it. And this is where, all of the stuff that we're going to talk about, and in particular, um, you know, products like the bio offers that's part of the, the the nuance network, and so it's plug and play and ready to go. And we'll, we'll dive into that. And then obviously, through all the support that Olympus has done with the SVS program and the ability to immediately run select CTs. And so, you know, it was the automation, it was the speed for us, and it was the screening. And that's I think, you know, fitting into everything we love about pulmonary medicine. So. Shortly, you know, mid-COVID for me, I started uh, at this hospital system and then started building a, a lung uh, volume reduction program. And it was hard. When Once you're dealing with the pandemic, it, office visits aren't plentiful. Um, I'm going to show some information in there. I mean, you're just, you've got just a handful of partners who recognize this disease who may say, oh, this patient may or may not fit the criteria. Um, but, you know, you've reached the limit. 
you know, and I tell these folks, there is nothing else that I can do beyond the medicine that you've been prescribed. We've optimized pulmonary rehab. You don't have pulmonary hypertension, but here's another, another option for you. And so we would get these patients and say, fantastic, you may be a candidate, but let's go through this long checklist of things and finally get you a CT and then get you a rule and rule out. And so since that time, as we were kind of thinking about how we can make this better, we were introduced to, to this pilot, which we'll talk about shortly. And as of today, we're about 50 patients uh, served, um, which really streamlined a lot. And I'll talk about that more once we get into how the actual AI was able to help us out. Yeah, I mean, we've been doing valves from a research perspective for quite some time, um, both clinical trials and then ultimately for air leaks. And then um, obviously the, the launch of the uh, two valve products uh, in 18 and 19 um, helped kickstart our program into high gear. Um, and as I was already saying, this, this satisfies me in every capacity, the ability to be a pulmonologist and a proceduralist. Um, you know, just it, it, as it's it continued to uptake, literally last week we did five cases and they were all patients that we found via screening. You know, I, 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 I take my patient flow in kind of two categories. There's ones that are specifically referred for valves, you know, coming to see me, I can't breathe, can this guy get valves? That's fine, There's, you know, the standard workup, et cetera. And, and, you know, some people qualify, some people don't, and frequently they don't qualify for CT reasons. But when you find someone on the screening perspective, this was somebody <clears throat> not sent for valves, the scan was done within my health system for whatever reason, doesn't matter, the scan was automatically already read and evaluated for the degree of emphysema by Embio, right, and then immediately ported over and a select CT reports is there and readily available. It's incredible. And I mean, I'll just kind of touch on that. So say you've not done the valves and you saw this flyer and you're like, all right, I'm here to learn about it. What does all that mean? So you take that patient, somebody shows up on your doorstep. I mean, I read a plethora of PFTs and I'm like, okay, you're hyperinflated, severe COPD. Let's bring you in and talk about it. So then within finding that patient, there's about a 27 point checklist. You go through optimized medicines. Have you had surgery? Are you um, dependent on steroids, pulmonary hypertension? So you work through all of that piece. Then you found them by PFTs, they're not hypercapnic. Now you're ready to say, all right, let's see if your CT warrants uh, the application of valves. Now you do that, and then you either have a happy patient or a disappointed patient. I'm sorry, your fissure integrity didn't meet, you have collateral ventilation that's suspected, or your emphysema is bad, but it's not that bad. And so then you may have a rule out. And then, so you've done all of this work, and it started with just reading one out of a thousand PFTs that you did that time, but what if we could do it smarter? I mean, you get hundreds upon hundreds of lung cancer screening CTs and a population is gonna have emphysema. What can we do with that info and kind of data mine it and pull those out? So all you're doing is looking at those that are saying they already meet by CT perspective. Fissure integrity greater than 90%, emphysema, emphysema percentage greater than 40%. Let's call them and bring them in. So I mean, that's exciting to be able to kind of turn that TP around or that triangle and start feeding them into you a lot better. And yep. so, go ahead. Well, no, it's that threshold. I mean, look, you, you can't get out of the emergency room without a CT these days. Let's face it, most people's lung natural program survives because of the need for a CT, uh, you know, for every patient in the ER, it seems. I mean, obviously, I'm exaggerating. So why wouldn't you also want to have that CT be actually fully read and evaluated for the multiple different things that could be potentially going on and done in a way that's automated and done in a way that's not, you know, in the way of the radiologist who's reading the scan for the primary reason of like, you know, is there a clot? Is there, you know, a nodule, blah, blah, blah. So anyway, let's dive deeper. So this was kind of some information from, from my system. You know, we had individual challenges, but what it came down to is there was a handful of pulmonologists in, in saying, if you want to be successful, um, you know, this isn't an IP derived procedure where you have to be IP trained to do it. You can be a general pulmonologist, proceduralist, advanced bronchoscopist, but you have to have that physician champion, someone that says, all right, for our group here, I'm going to do this. And I'm going to do it really well. Now we got to figure out how to find patients. And I said, uh, I was reading approximately 1,400 PFTs. I've got a couple of pulmonologists, the other PCPs who would order it, and I would send them a message, hey, hyperinflation, consider a candidate, and then hope that they would get that patient back to me. So doing that process, before we started using the AI platform, I told you, Kyle, I was maybe doing one to two cases a month, kind of slow, not really gaining traction. My C-suite wasn't aware of it because, well, I wasn't having to spend a lot of money. I was being supported by Olympus to bring in valves per case. But once they started seeing that we were able to turn those one and two cases a month to what you're talking about right there. I was doing between two, three, four cases a week. Now I'm stocking valves on the shelf. Now I've got product ready to use. Now they're starting to say, well, wait a second. 
The DRG is what? The <laughs> workup costs what? Yeah, we don't mind spending a couple hundred thousand dollars or whatever it may be to stock valves on this shelf so we can support you going forward. And so for us, I mean, there was no argument about it. It was not like buying a fancy robot or whatever. It was immediate, short-term patient admission, patient procedure, good payback on the other end of it, and then good outcomes at the end. So it wasn't for me a big complication or a big headache to, to get our, our folks to buy into it. No, I mean, valves are a total win because they do everything you want them in the sense of like, you're going to make someone breathe better, period. So that's awesome. So they're great for patients. The right patients, obviously, but they're great for patients. They're also really great for a health system. They're really great because of the contribution margin that occurs here. And so anything that can improve the numbers through your valve program, appropriate numbers through your valve program is good for everybody. The patient's winning and your program is winning and the financial bottom line wins. And that is like, you know, you're right, Bob, like you got, it's not a, you know, it might be a fight to get the quote expensive robot. It becomes a lot less of a fight when you generate significant revenue for the health system from your valve program than you are. And these are direct contribution margins, not downstream revenue. So, you know, and so that was our immediate interest. I mean, we, we, got in bio for the sole purpose of in dramatically increasing our valve program, period. And, you know, the whole thing is because getting it put in through you know, the Nuance network, it's simple. It's literally plug and play. Um, there's not a lot of work uh, involved on that, on, on the, on the IT side, on the back end. Um, and so it's incredible. So let's go on to that next slide and, and dive deeper. So these are some of the things that we talked about already in, in improves referral. The integration piece was pretty simple. I mean, once I collaborated with the Olympus group and then the Embio group, I introduced them to our head of radiology, talked to our IT department, answered a lot of the hospital concern questions. Will this violate HIPAA? No. All the data is pre-screened, so the, the analyst, the software is not privy to it. It's just a, a number line item that they see. So there was no concerns for HIPAA compliance, so everybody, including the attorneys, was happy with that. Um, and then the, the, the fact that you can just sit there in the background and say, oh, wait, there's my inbox. I've got five new candidates that just met, and now I can go pull them up on my own time and kind of pilfer through them, and that was really, really easy. Right. I mean, that, that's the whole point here, because especially when you look at um, what, nuance is, what Nuance does, and they are in a vast majority of the health systems across the United States, and they've essentially – but the non-radiology and non-IT person, what they've done is built essentially an, an, an established network that has already passed all of the, you know, HIPAA compliance and PHI compliance and all the things that your health system worry about. And they, they've got this. So then what this does is it gives you this suite of options, you know, and, and, and bio is one of them that was going to solve this for us. I mean, there's many, many other things that are available on Nuance to do other things that you might want to do. But for us, we want to, and, and, and bio included, it does many other things. But my particular interest, and yours too, Bobby, was to 100% increase the valve referral rate by simply screening every single T CT scan that's done in our health system for the degree of emphysema, fissure integrity, and then porting it over to a select CT and getting a report, and getting a report automatic. Like, let's not forget the cumbersome burden it is to actually take a scan and then get it evaluated in these up you know to upload to these various portals to determine if your patient's even a candidate for valves you know I, bobby you and i've talked about this before like when i was a kid you know computers were somebody supposed to make my life much more efficient and better and i think all of us who have an emr would agree that all computers have done is make our life a thousand times harder and this is the one and only time for real that i do nothing and i get a weekly well, actually a daily report of everyone who's a candidate for vows. It's incredible. And with no effort on anyone's part, because it's all being done automatic through what Embio is able to do and all because it's plugged in with nuance and then it goes into that select CT report. That's it. I mean, it's it's incredible. I've got, uh, there's some slides downstream that talks about our actual numbers, what we did within our respective pilots. And we'll talk about how we can streamline it now. Uh, we, we alluded a little bit on how we were able to, once we identify a patient, it was probably, I say 30 to 60 days, but sometimes even 60 to 90 days on able to find somebody and then get them through that whole workup process to get their echo, get them involved in pulmonary rehab. And then we were able to decrease that to once we identify via select CT and getting that report, I actually could put in valve in patient in less than 30 days. So that was really, really good. <clears throat> 
I mean, it is. It's but but you know, there's the speed. I mean, you you know, you don't want to have patients drop out. Um, and but it's also like anything that required a significant amount. You know, for me, what it comes down to is how many clicks do I have to involve, right? And how many phone calls do I have to ask someone to do something, and then I have to upload something or click something or de-identify something or and again, all those you say, someone goes, oh, it's just one or two clicks on top of the 10,000 clicks I'm doing every day, right? Yeah. And you know, anytime someone tells me it's one or two clicks, I, my, I roll my eyes because it's never just one or two clicks. Yeah. And so I think the, the, cent, the one square right over there that says that the nuance pin in, in bio automatically transfers qualifying scans, the word automatic, that's the part, right? This was not any heavy lift for anybody. Um, and that both streamlined people that are directly referred for valves. I've ordered the scan. Boom, this is happening. And all the other scans that are getting done throughout my entire medical system for any number of reasons. And, like, you know, look, if, and when Bobby and I show the numbers, there are plenty of people who qualify by CAT scan who are not valve candidates. That CAT scan might have been done because they've got stage four sarcoma everywhere, blah, blah, blah. Fine, fine. You know, obviously they're not a valve candidate. But, but the point was, and when you send, we send a letter off to the per, uh, person who ordered the scan, you know, they will say, uh, not a candidate for, you know, any other medical reasons, but they've already passed the largest hurdle and that's the CT scan, right? You know, they may have other contraindications of valves. They may have bad, they may have a bad scan, but actually have pretty decent capacity, pretty decent quality of life and lung function. Great. Maybe they're not even all that gas trapped. Great. Good for them. But at a minimum, the thing that, like when Bobby was saying, you get these people going through this entire workup and then they finally get a CAT scan and then you go, oh, I'm sorry. And, you know, we, we could have halted this whole process from the beginning. And and when every time we looked, it's rare that we fail someone for PFTs. It's rare we fail someone for multiple contraindications, but we very much fail people when we're working up on the front end on the CAT scan side. Well, what, you know, the, you're talking about finding ways to make things smarter. You know, we're all kind of cost conscious within this spectrum now. And certainly, you know, I've told you before, I live in the poorest state in the nation. Access to cure is horrible. So I've already two months ago screened a patient for lung cancer screening. Well, I'll finally say, well, wait a second. You may be a valve candidate too, or you were sent to me. So now I go through all this process as previous. Oh, and, and you got to pay for another scan to run through this algorithm to see if you have fissures and emphysema. Medicare is paying 100% for lung cancer screening. We've gone from 600 a year to 1,800 a year screen patients, and I could just pluck that data. If it wasn't picked up before my pilot, I can say, hey, Invio, this was done a month ago before I started the Invio software full service. Can you run this scan through there? You get to reuse information and something that somebody else paid for that the patient didn't have to spend money on, which is huge. That's right. So, some of these things that we kind of talk about already, um, you know, Kyle had done a much longer one-year pilot program uh, for them, and then they wanted to see what does it look like outside the academic side of things, and let's see what it actually looks like. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, but look like in the real world, Kyle, or uh, real pulmonologists practicing out there in the nitty-gritty. <laughs> uh, I'm just teasing. Um, but we did a much shorter process to say, what does it look like over 90 days? So some of the things that 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 you may have to think about, did it affect um, the wait time for patients. So for me, no. Um, we we really worked hard to reduce barriers for referrals for any patients. So we're currently sitting in about a, a one week or less wait time to see a new patient. Um, within the pilot that I did, I really want to add some extra clinics because we just, our, our capacity, you know, with all the other things that we get preferred. So that was simple. We would just about every two or three weeks have a one clinic that it was just valves. And, and yeah. you know, so it, it made the clinic quick because it was a themed clinic, right? Yeah. And um, so I know, Kyle, you actually had a really good throughput and in, in revenue increase, you hired a nurse navigator and people have asked me that same question, but because my pilot was 90 days, I've told you before, I really wanted to oversee this baby and, and limit the hands that were in there, show proof of concept, show the ROI. So I actually just had my nurse pull my PFTs, pull the most recent uh, uh, clinic note, and then I actually oversaw that whole process. And I know that you guys have really benefited from having a nurse navigator implement the high volume. Well, we've been able to, um, we got it approved precisely because our contribution margin averages between two to $7,000 every time we do a valve. That's direct contribution margin. So you times that times the number of valves, and that's when I walked in and said, I've made you this much, start buying me things. <laughs> so that's a simple discussion. For once, as a bronchoscopist, you're not using the words downstream revenue that make people roll their eyes. And by the way, you know, 
softwares all, all have a cost involved. And when you have someone go, well, what's the software cost? And I go, well, it's going to cost about me doing five more valves. And, you know, that's that's a non-issue, right? That this the, the whole consideration of using the nuanced network that your hospital likely already has and plugging it in bio and then getting essentially all these more valves, plus, again, everything else that in bio does, which we'll talk about later. You know, I, like I said, I'm interested in the valve side, but I've got my entire ILD program. It loves what we get with bio for that. Our coronary artery calcium people, you know, our, our, our cardiology group's been getting increased referrals because we keep finding more people. It, it, the list goes on and on. Um, and so, you know, the, the 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 marketing department's working on a campaign to essentially talk about how if you come to our hospital, we're going to really and truly get every ounce of data out of your CAT scan. You know, someone might have done it to say, you know, why has he got chest pain? It's great. No, we, I don't know. I don't see a lung mass, you know, like it's, you know, whatever, right? So whatever dumb thing it'll say in the report. But the rest of the scan, all these subtle things are not being ever measured or quantified, but now they can be. And it's all being done. And more importantly, it's it's on the back end, like I said. So this is not more work for your radiologist. Your radiologist is not seeing this and then having to like validate it, quantify it, or change anything. This is all being added to their report. And so, you know, keeping in the theme of how to build a BLBR program, some people worry about uh, acquisition of outside records. I agree with you. I mean, um, I, we get our own set of PFTs if there's concerning variability in there. I mean, ABGs are pretty standard. Echo reports, good grief. I mean, one person reads a TR jet, the other person has no, it doesn't mention it at all. So that I may re redo. And then especially if I've got um, choosing between left, right, upper lobe, percentage is the same. Visual integrity is both good. I'd like to have my guys who understand what I'm looking for get that VQ scan to help me understand which one should I target. That's right. Yep. Um, I don't know how you were doing it. People ask me, okay, I'm really concerned. The post-procedural pneumothorax rate in the literature is this. What is yours? What do you do? I know one practitioner, he he sends them to the ICU afterwards. Well, um, I admit initially would admit to a hospitalist that I'm doing, I have a middleman manage the inpatient inside. So I actually have myself and an MP. We admit it to, my, to each other, to myself. Um, I do mine on a Monday, discharge on Wednesday, do, do next case Wednesday, discharge on Friday. If I'm on call on the weekend, I'll do it Friday, discharge on Sunday, assuming that there's no complications. I don't like to have more than one admitted at a time because, well, one, I don't have fellows and everything else like some folks may have. And so it's, it's kind of difficult. So we try to make it that one patient, one admission, and just give them all of our all of our attention. So it didn't really affect my bronchoscopy program at all. It fits in really well. It's not an added volume. I play well with my partner who's doing bronchoscopy, so it's pretty easy. Yeah, I think you know all politics is local. I think the thing here is is you know you're you're right about one thing, Bobby, and that is you know all, valves obviously have uh, a pneumothorax rate. Period. And so um, our approach has always been we just assume that every single patient is going to get one. Obviously, that's not true. But if you're ready for that, then you're prepared for that. And that answers then the question is who's getting called at two in the morning. Right. And so you've got, you know, every, anyone can do the procedure. It's what do you do, you know, later when there's a pneumo, et cetera. And so that is one other component of building this program is the resources around it. So for us, the simplest thing was outside of every patient's room, like you have here, is our pneumothorax cart. Right. Because sometimes, and depending on your hospital, finding everything you need to deal with the pneumothorax can be a challenge and you don't necessarily have a lot of time. So we've got a cart that has every single thing you need to do to fix a patient's pneumothorax. Because again, we're gonna assume that every single patient is gonna have one. Yeah, it, I mean, for me, we took it a, a step further since I've handled the admission. So we built an order set. There were clear parameters what the nurses should, shouldn't do about incentive spirometry, no. I didn't want, did any deviation from the patient's norm. I'm basically just taking them in, assuming that they may not have this, I don't want to say, well, what's on the hospital formulary? Bring your medicine. Well, I don't like the hospital's BiPAP. Bring your NIV, whatever that may be. As much as that you do at home, bring that to the hospital and let's just make it standard. Have a chest tube kit in the room so you're ready to go, not chasing things if you have to go in. Have right. your protocol set in place, your anti tussive uh, medicine's already ordered, and just streamline it as much as possible. That makes it really, really easy, in my opinion. Yeah, agree completely. Um, and, the, and the thing down at the bottom, awareness you know there's there's so much you can do at a minimum there's a lot of pulmonary rehab uh programs in your general area um you need to let them know what you're doing because that is you take care of one patient out of a pulmonary rehab program that entire pulmonary rehab program will be coming to see you oh yeah 
Yeah, I, I work a lot. I don't know how it is with you guys in the city, but we have a one inpatient, but there are two companies that we help write the program for, me and my partner, about what we wanted them to do, and it's specific per patient. ILD, PR, set them up, we're going to want to do this. Post valve patient with severe emphysema, we want the focus to be on this. And so really engaging with them in the outpatient sector really helped us out a lot. Yeah, for sure. Um, creating the awareness, I think you actually sum it up a lot better on the next slide with all of yeah. these pictures. Um, and some of the things that we did. I mean, I'm, I've been on the news. We've published on um, Facebook groups uh, sponsored by the hospital. We've done some videos and some patient testimonials. I know you've been pretty involved in it as well. Yeah, no, for sure. It matters. It, you know, if you look there, our hospital has this thing to call at the forefront. It's like a talk show, quote, quote, you know, and Facebook and YouTube and all that. We've made simple little videos. Um, you know, this is, this is this does not have to be a remote budget. I mean, everyone's got everyone's got an iPhone of some kind or equivalent. You, you can make a video, right? And 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 have it there and be available. And then you know, it's it's letting everyone in the region know what you're doing, and setting it broadly. Because here's the thing too: so the the one limitation to valve programs, beyond obviously the the the, the looking for the CT based issues, is for whatever reason, for people who don't do this procedure at all, the only thing in their mind that satisfies a valve is the net criteria uh, for the surgery, you know, that study that's over two decades old. And of course, as we know, valves have much well, similar but much different criteria. So um, our approach has been to ask every single uh, referring doc, I said, look, you know, if, if they have any amount of COPD, typically gold stage three and up, there's three or four, and an elevated RV. And I don't even give them a number. I, I don't want anybody over screening. I would rather see you and have you not be a candidate that's fine. And that, you know, and that, by the way, keeps building your referral base. Because then all I say to the patient, say, look, you got an amazing pulmonologist. You know, you're not a candidate for this procedure, but the fact that they even thought you might be means that they're thinking and they're thinking about you and they're trying to solve you. So they leave my office without a procedure, but they leave with you, the referring doc, basically being praised for thinking about this and thinking about you and thinking beyond just, oh, I'm going to swap one inhaler for another inhaler, which we all know is doesn't do squat. And so, you know, it's a win for everybody, especially even the referring doc, even when you're not a candidate. And by the way, you know, for your own program, as we know, there's other therapies coming down the pipeline for COPD management, other therapeutic procedures that will be complementary to valves. Now they may not get approved, but let's assume they do. Then establishing the roots now for a COPD based bronc program gets you primed and ready to go when these other potential procedures are also available to add to your valve program. We've talked a lot about <clears throat> all this stuff now. Let's just get down to the nitty gritty from what we actually did. Okay. Good Lord, look at that video. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think unfortunately yours is next is sexier than what mine is, but you know, in a community-based program, once we started that 90-day pilot, we, we screened, uh, at least the system did, 871 patients. So 871 scans that I would not really know unless I directly ordered it. Then who met the fissure integrity of 90%, 40% emphysema? 113 out of those. And then how many lobes there? And 74. And then out of all of that, either for different reasons, I, you know, the, some of these are still in the pipeline, waiting for them to quit smoking, letting them finish pulmonary rehab. Uh, these are actually ones who got within that 90 days. 28 patients in 90 days, not bad at all. I mean, that's really, really good. But there were just some, regardless of what the scans show, once you get them in front of you, you're like, you are a poor protoplasm for valves. Now I see why, you know, your functional status is too bad. You're wheelchair dependent. Oh, you have multiple myeloma undergoing chemotherapy. This is not the option for you. But you don't know that just by looking at the scan, but it really does help to bring them in and discuss it. Absolutely. You're Yours is next, and I think it looks a lot better. Yeah, so we had basically just under a year of screening and, and, and tons of scans done. And again, kind of, you know, and, our, and the reason why we had a drop off is that, you know, large university, lots of scans being done for many different reasons and, and so forth. So um, uh, wide variation in why scans are getting done. Um, and, you know, in my area, um, the, uh, there's wide variation, as we know, across the U.S. in smoking rates as well, too. I'm going to go out on a limb and think it's a, probably assume it's a little bit higher in, in Bobby's population, um, uh, at least based on study, studies of, you know, smoking rates by state. Um, and then we've got people that are qualified. And then so far, the same idea, some that have either received or in the final stages. And that was from that pilot. We've obviously done more since then. And again, like we've talked about, there's plenty that don't qualify for many other reasons. But they and, and when we send the letter off to the to the referring doc who um, who ordered the scan, you know, we'll, they'll write back and say, 
you know, I talked to the guy, like he runs up five flights of stairs. Well, then, yeah, you're not a candidate for valves because I'm not sure I'm going to, how am I supposed to make you any better? You know, I remember a guy got sent to me once for valves whose six minute walk test was uh, the best I'd ever seen on anyone, you know? And so I was like, wow, you know, um, I'm not sure what you're looking for uh, from this procedure. So, you know, but, it, and again, these are patients that you don't have. These are not, none of these are my scans, right? I order plenty of scans for any number of other reasons. These are ones that were never going to be in my system. Yeah, so we, you know, we've talked a lot about the details, but, you know, there are probably folks on the call that have, that are already doing this and seeing some of the positive outcomes, but I'm sure there are, there are others who are saying, man, I, I'm just, almost there to bite the bullet or really, really start this. And I, and I think patient stories and anecdotes is really helpful for that. And yeah. I think you've got a good one right here. Yeah, this one's great because this was a lady who came to me, referred in April for a nine millimeter nodule in the right middle alone. It had been six millimeters found on an LDCT. And the follow-up scan was, you know, the first the original scan was three millimeter cuts when it said it was bigger. So um, she's based on, on two liters nasal cannula. She quit smoking four years ago. So we got a new CT scan done because we we're going to do a robotic based bronch to go biopsy this thing and, you know, prove what was going on. Um, and sure enough, it turned out to be an adenocarcinoma. It was a good bronch and, and all her nodes were negative. So stage one, caught early, yay, low dose screening. Uh, she was referred for SBRT. Now, right up front, I mean, you know, you could I could take the story and say I should have asked her about, you know, what her symptoms and how far could she walk and yada 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 and i and i love doing valves but the only thing on my brain was i got a nodule that has lung cancer or likely has lung cancer go bronker period so we order a scan because i need to just build a three-dimensional you know the, the map for the for the robot so that was it and so then she goes back to my clinic in july and she's doing well she's finished sbrt and it's been a short interval but she looks great and she says you know i'm really short of breath and and you know help me my inhalers and whatnot so that scan done back in april demonstrating the right middle lobe nodule had also indicated that her left upper lobe was an ideal target for valves based on the Imbio report. So as I'm pulling up her scan and looking at it in my PAX window, there's the select CT report. I don't have to log in any kind of portal or anything. It's right there, the way we've built it into our system. So as I'm seeing her, I was like, you know, let's talk about valves. And of course, there's nowhere near a malignancy, right? And, and her, her radiation oncologist was cool with it. I, I didn't need to make sure, but I did, you know, and he had, he was like, great, make her breathe better. So prior to, you know, uh, uh, to doing this procedure, our RV was at 220 and our FEV was 35. So she had no BLVR. We put six valves in the left upper lobe, just that was her anatomy, total low bar occlusion. And in clinic on follow-up, her RV was down to 175, FEV was 46%. And she obviously had markedly less dyspnea with exertion. So what I love about this is, you know, here is somebody who, you know, and I'm a guy who thinks of valves and the only thing on my brain was, you know, cancer robot, blah, blah, blah and be done with her. And, and you know, if she hadn't even come back to see me, you know, and, and wasn't part of our bio process, I, I, this lady would have never had the opportunity to breathe better because I failed because my single focus was on her cancer, as it should be on one level, but the automation is what flagged her that I was able to help this lady twice. That's fantastic, Kyle. Um, I, I think I've got a couple of anecdotes, but we're gonna bridge them off this next slide. So there are some reasons why that we can't do it. Um, uh, so. PFTs, um, and then if they're a current smoker, and some of the referring pulmonologists I would talk to say, and I've known this guy for years, he's never gonna quit. And I said, I hear you. I'm not saying I'm gonna say anything different than you, but let me talk to him about it. And amazingly, once they finally hear it from the person that's gonna say, I can probably help you, but you gotta quit smoking. I'm, I'm looking at double digits so far in patients who have saying, if that's it, and I'm 55, all right, I'm right. done. And I actually got them to quit smoking, and they've stayed smoke, uh, quit this whole time. Um, right. I don't. I don't think age is a limitation based on their functional status. My oldest one, she was 86, and the next day walking with a therapist, they had to tell her to slow down walking in the hallway, and I was like really, really proud of that one. Yeah. Um, the symptoms you already mentioned it. No exercise limitations. You got other things that are limiting them. You find out okay, you're actually undergoing treatment. Pulmonary hypertension. I mean, if they're borderline. 45 to 50, because that 50 is that exclusion portion, I may actually then proceed with a right heart cath just to confirm based on what the echo estimates. And then I've actually had some that say, I don't care, I'm not quitting, or I'm not really interested. I'm just gonna live my life and who cares? Yeah. And I, and those are the people, you know, again, it's been interesting. Vows have been the, um, 
the carrot to hold out to quit smoking. And you're right. Um, you know, I don't have direct numbers, but there's definitely been a, a significant amount of people that that's been the motivator. Um, you know, not not the degree of emphysema, but the possibility of being able to help for the degree of emphysema. <laughs> not their precancerous lung nodule that you pick up somewhere either. It's like this is what makes you quit. I mean, you got lung cancer or a possible nodule? No, it's this. That is actually whatever more it takes, right? And in the end, about yeah. smoke cessation, you know, I. I I give a lecture on it in medical school and then I tell people, look, it doesn't matter why, it's only that they do. Yeah. <laughs> so. so demonstrating some of the success, this may have been some things that we talked about as a group already, um, but I agree. You know, I don't necessarily have that competitive health system. I think there's a neighboring hospital that does these with a, a different type of valve system. Um, but I think there's a lot of things, but one of the main things that I think really changed our thought process, because you and I talk a lot about different robot systems and then how C-suites look at this. And I imagine the people on the call thinking the same thing is that when I went to approach them with a new device, they said, okay, and I know this is about valves, but they say, well, you want to add this, but there's not, no other charge code that we can do adding to your robotic procedure. So we may not want to do this. And I said, can you please stop looking at our acquisition of equipment just based on this procedure, just right. EBIT, just robotic bronchoscopy, just pleuroscopy, et cetera. I want you to look at us as a department. And as soon as they did that and they pulled our numbers for everything that we do, it really was a, a non-conversation a non at that point to say, you've already paid for how many robots at this point based on the balance that you've done? It, it doesn't become much of a, a conversation with the value analysis committee and everything else. No, I mean, this, this is, you know, valve programs, lead to an improvement in the bottom line. It's, it's that simple. This is one of the few times that you can walk into the C-suite and definitively tell them how you're going to add to the entire you know, process at the medical center. Um, you, know, I, you, you get a big seat at the table for once. Um, and it's not you and I just holding our hat out begging for equipment. Um, and I think you know, the, the value of a valve program as well is it's, it's, it's you know, and I, I don't even tell you like, Bobby, you probably had the same experience. I mean. Prior to us doing valves, I mean, almost every bronc, you know, you're diagnosing yet another cancer, yet another cancer, you know, once in a while it turned out to be infection, thank God. But like, you know, you love the work you do and you love how much you're handling and helping the, you know, the patients, but it is nice to go in for the sole purpose of just trying to help someone breathe better, you know, and, and it's, there's a, a, and then you're absolutely right. This is I, the thing that's so cool about valves. And, you know, if you don't have a valve program, this is worth investing in is, you know, I can already tell you, forget CAT scans and PFTs when they come in follow up. When I open the door to the clinic, and the first thing I do when I walk in is the spouse or the brother, sister run up and hug you, you know yeah. how well you, and then, and then the patient, I mean, it's incredible. You get the like, you've returned to my brother, you returned to my wife, you return, you know, whatever, whatever, to being a person again. It is unbelievable. And it's, it's, it's so satisfying, right? It, it, re, it recharges that, uh, you know, the, the, I, you know, our job is its own drain on you, and it recharges and that. It, 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 it frees up some pessimism. Uh, the and, and, of having another stage four cancer patient that you have to have that discussion with, and then you got to go to the next room and talk about some end of life stuff, where you got to talk about the anxiety of what's on my lung cancer screening CT. Then your right. next patient comes in and says, "I want to tell you, I don't know if I'm supposed to, but I haven't been wearing my oxygen for like a week. And my stats <laughs> are normal. Can you believe right. it? Is that okay?" I'm like. Let's do a walk test and find out, but probably so. Yeah, it's incredible, right? Let's see, some final thoughts. Um, you know, some people ask me, they're like, hey, I've done my, my valve, and I don't know if I need to go back in there and reassess placement. Did they migrate? Um, do I, I didn't see complete lobar atelectasis. And, you know, I, I've toyed with that several times. You and I have talked about that a lot of times. And one of the things, that we have to think about is don't forget about our, our pulmonary physiology is that these people don't have normal pleural spaces. Um, but are we treating the CT or the x-ray or are we treating the patient? Right. And if someone comes back to me and says, yeah, I'm, I'm one, two weeks, three weeks post procedure, I feel great. I'm singing again or what have you. But I look at their x-ray and I see not low bar atelectasis, but I see a little bit of elevated diaphragm and my functional status has improved. I'm not chasing it down and say, we need to rebronch you in six weeks to see if they're still in place because sure. did we change VQ? And if we change VQ based on some of these patients, it's fantastic for them sure. because that's all that matters. 
you're unloading the diaphragm, you're unloading that sense of dyspnea. The enemy, the enemy of good is better, right? And uh, yeah. now, if the patient's not responded, hasn't had a good response, is then yeah, absolutely get in there and and figure out that you place them correctly, etc. You know, did they did they settle in, etc. You know, did, did your side branch open? Any number yeah. of things, right? And and of course, then there's always going to be those people, despite everything being perfect, that you know still had collateral ventilation or still had adhesions, right? So that's something you weren't able to get the total lobar collapse you wanted to get out of it. But I will say, I mean, I know you've talked about doing it a bunch of times, but that. There are there are also times where you may not achieve that, but then you get, see some PFTs and you're like, holy cow! So you're actually prove, moving a lot more airflow despite what I'm seeing on imaging. That's right. You know, Bob. The other thing that's really interesting, you know, so you know, we talked about this. I mean, the, the cornerstone to all this has been, you know, what Inbio has been able to do. You know, obviously based uh, within what Nuance is capable of. But people listening may not be aware, but but Inbio actually literally just. Uh, partnered and, and is now acquired with 4D Medical. And 4D's got a whole suite of services that are gonna be added potentially to this as well on top of what you and I already did. Like I said, I, I'm the one who pushed to get in bio at my institution. I wanted valves, more valves. And the happy buy product that came from this was that my entire ILD program, every single scan is screened for early interstitial lung disease. And again, I, you know, I don't, I have, five colleagues that only do ILD and I do zero ILD, but they are pumped beyond belief because they've been able to recruit more and more people for early ILD trials. Um, and again, the coronary artery calcification scoring, the ability for us to be able to do multiple other aspects. And then you know, in bio and others have partnered with River Range, so we've got lung nodule abilities, but you know, now with 4D on board uh, within bio, you know, it's going to be really exciting to see where this is headed. Um, I think it's going to represent a lot of good, positive changes for where you and I are trying to go. Um, and then I think our final slide here is how to get more information from all these folks, uh, starting with, I'm going to go ahead, yeah, and then the uh, QR code to be able to learn more about the valves. But I think, um, you know, this is where things get, you know, it, this is just the start, right? You know, I think, um, the the when you when we talked when I talked to my C-suite, I said, look, you know, this is a software, and you know they they are kind of like, well, and I said, look, it's going to do this, which is going to do more procedures. So I can already tell you, it's going to pay for itself. And they said, well, and I said, okay, well, look, it's a software, so sign a one-year contract then. And if I'm wrong, cut it off, right? I mean, that's the other beauty. You're not buying hardware where if it doesn't work out, you're stuck with it. It's software. Do it. You don't find any value in it. You don't see any increase in your valves. You will, but let's pretend. Get rid of it. That was and that was the deal I cut with my C-suite, which was there is zero reason. There's nothing to lose here. And of course, you know when the numbers came through, they're like, okay, you you were right. <laughs> so. Yeah, I talked with Olympus about this when I was starting my own. I was like, yes, I, I'm doing one to two patients. I can't just stock my shelves with valves. This is really hard. How can you help me kind of grow a program? The rep and the staff there were, were tremendously helpful to say, I can help support you for a case. I'll bring in valves or trunk circle, what have you. And then once I started seeing my growth curve, then it would it, it made going into looking at saying, all right, I can do successful procedures. I can have good outcomes. Let's see what can what happens when we really flip the switch, turn on the AI, let's start rolling them in here. Because right. you do want to have that little phase of growth so you're not inundated with all this stuff at the very beginning. You kind of dip right. your toes into it and then turn that switch on. They'll start, start coming to you. Yeah. Back it up one real quick. Um, you know, just so people have the contact information. These are two really good people to meet up with. Um, Eric, from the perspective of, of learning, you, you, many people on this call uh, may not be aware. They probably have the Nuance Network built in their medical center, which means that acquiring any of these AI-based technologies um, becomes ridiculously simple. Um, particularly starting with Embio. And then Ariel's uh, ultimately in charge from the product perspective on helping you to build your valve program from the perspective of getting uh, the right people in front of you uh, and resources in front of you from the Olympus perspective. Um, so worth reaching out to both of those folks um, if you really want to try to grow and pursue your uh, valve program. I don't know if we were going to entertain any questions, but um, yeah. I'm ready. So I think there's uh, should be questions coming into the old chat or q a thing uh, those of you that are uh, playing from home uh feel free to uh send them in um yes we do have a few so we'll hop right into the q a portion of this lecture 
Um, oh, hit it, Ed. Here's the first one. How do you manage the influx of patients when you implement this kind of program, as well as do either of the docs have a nurse navigator? Yep, yep. Um, but you don't don't get overwhelmed by thinking, oh my gosh, they they just this guy did 800 scans or whatever. I don't see all of that, right? It's not coming to you in in bulk. So for me, in a smaller hospital system, you know, I was getting qualified scans of around four, maybe four to five a week. I would hand that off to my nurse, say pull the PFTs, do a rule in rule out based on PFTs, and then if they met by those two criteria, set up an appointment. So. I didn't need a nurse navigator at first because again, we were just doing a 90 day setup for that. I could see the projection that if we maintain that growth curve, we probably would. And I think Kyle, I think you already have one. Yeah, and for us, the, you know, so the influx like it was, it was, you know, adding on a couple extra clinics just to get more space. But the other thing is on, on another level, like, you know, you don't wanna make people wait forever, but it is an elective procedure. You know, you wanna strike while the iron's hot, but if someone calls and you say, I can see in two or three weeks, there are worse things in the world, right? You know, so we, we cause our clinic is set up to get nodules within, you know, someone calls with a nodule that should be seen within a week um, and as, as it should be, right? Um, and so, you know, but you know, the other thing was is that the um, kind of part and parcels, our valve program grew, um, we obviously our entire program grew and we, we hired um, another faculty member in the Bronx side and as we've continued to grow we actually just got approval to hire a fourth interventionalist at the University of Chicago you know and it's not just valves it's not the only thing obviously it's growing clearly you know nodules and everything else but everything is growing we only are showing positive numbers when we talk to administration that's how we're getting a fourth interventionalist approved and it's how we get various navigators approved and you know again the argument we made um, when, when you, if you if you come to the University of Chicago and you have a lung cancer and you come from an out or any cancer, it, a navigator helps to make sure everything's happening, everything's getting coordinated, and it makes it seamless and smooth for the patients. And you know then obviously that generates revenue, so hence why people invest in oncology. And when we walked up to the table, we said we're already making you money. We want to make you more money, and this is how we're going to do it. You need to help us streamline the whole process. We need someone to own this process. And it can't be the busy physician who's busy, you know, running around brocking this, running to the ICU, this, blah, blah, blah. It needs to be someone who can sort of be in the background, managing and coordinating and moving the patients along and make sure people aren't falling off, et cetera. Um, and so, you know, it's gonna happen naturally and organically. I think that's the other beauty of it because the whole automation process through in bio and everything with nuance that it's, you can do it up front and it's not and much work on your side. Like you're right, Bobby, you didn't read 800 CT scans. You got handed a list of people that met already CT scan criteria, period. And then you can work through it from there. And then when it starts to become busy, that's a good thing because it means you're generating significant revenue. Now you have something to go talk at the table about, about gathering more to grow your program even more. These things feed on each other. Anything else? Question, yeah. Em? Yeah, oh, yeah we got a few more. Here we go. So the next one is, can you describe the process of obtaining the referral from the physician that originally ordered the patient's chest CT scan? Yeah, that's a great question. A lot of people are worried. Oh my gosh, I don't want you to steal my patient. Some patient, some pulmonologists may think that in a competitive market. Um, and so if you've been there, you just have a cordial conversation that says, hey, look, how do you want me to do it? And with my partner, it was easy. I said, do you want me to push all this information to you? And she's like, absolutely not. I'm busy as heck. I want you to just basically, you can call my patients, your nurse or whomever, and just say, set up an appointment. Um, and then if it was a PCP out in the community, um, we have a standard letter that I would send them via the EMR, trying to make that smart and just say, hey, um, if you don't know much about this, here's my cell, give me a call. Um, but this is something that may benefit your patient. And if you want me to help out, you know, make the referral, we'll get them taken care of. Yeah, we we made the mistake in, for about a week and we were trying to call patients directly and that was the equivalent of trying to uh, sell them car insurance over the phone. Uh, people had no idea who we were and they were, you know, I like to always quote, uh, Chris Bodrick is one of my favorite quotes where he says, I'm only a thousand mistakes ahead of you. And so um, I'm, I'm a thousand mistakes ahead of everybody else as well. And so uh, it, it, it's letters to whoever sent it. First of all, that's the person who knows the patient, right? And or the scan and has that therapeutic relationship. And then, it, and then, you know, even in a competitive market, they recognize that you're just there to offer the procedure, right? And we say that, we want to meet your patient to offer this procedure, period, and then send them back. I saw one in follow-up today, she's six months out, and I said, 
I want you to understand that your primary pulmonologist is managing all of this. I'm here to see you for an LVR follow-up, and, and he knows that as well. So it feels great making the referral. What else? Yeah, we got? let me add to that. Oh, One of the things that we worked with in bio about was to take some of the data they give. You know, get, you get these you get these lung texture reports. You get this degree of emphysema. It's 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 one of these, it, you know, it quantifies the degree and it shows it, it's very colorful. It's, it's, you know, kind of very easy to digest. And that's the idea, right? Even a busy physician who could clearly like read through everything, just give me the short version and make it easy. Yeah. So we have a patient facing letter now that will help to generate with the data from Imbio and, and it adds a little more snap to what we're trying to accomplish. Like you can clearly see the left lower lobe is very diseased on this, you know, color picture of the, et cetera, et cetera. So we've added that. And, and you know, it, this is, I think, the other beauty of the AI and the AI companies, you know, AI in healthcare for, you know, in a clinical application is obviously still in its relative infancy. And the companies that we are working with, they want to do better. They want to help. And so we've been able to work with Imbio directly and I, soon with 4D and anybody else, obviously through Nuance and in their entire uh, marketplace of, plug and play softwares that will add to this to make it better for what I need, right? And so, you know, you're the consumer, you should be demanding better, so. All right, here's another one for you guys. What was the biggest challenge getting your program started and what advice do you give to someone who's starting? Find someone else who's doing it good, reach out to them and talk about it. I mean, we, we are so collegial within this and what I like is that you don't have to be IP trained, anybody can do it. LinkedIn, it was been great. I mean, stuff like this is fantastic. But you know, if, if there are reservations about doing it, shoot somebody a blind email and just say, hey, don't know you, but I saw you on the podcast or I heard. Th I mean, I've cold called people for PDT in Washington State I've never even talked to before, just to talk right. about case and experiences and everything else. Tell me what you do. Why are you successful? Right. So first, I would say find somebody that's doing it really well. Pick their brain, brainstorm with them. Then after that, get in touch with your Olympus rep. Yep. No, it's uh, there's you know there's so many different resources, right? There's the there's the entire uh, Telegram uh, texting group between uh, folks who do IP and advanced bronchoscopy, and it's subdivided by topic. It's physicians only, and it's very open, very discussion based. You know, and and you know it's a great way to get a group opinion on things. Start with that. Talk with your folks, like he says. Talk talk to the Olympus folks and, and and get resources. And then honestly, reach out to people. I I feel about four to five emails and, and texts a week uh, from all over the country on people who I've either met briefly or don't know. But my God, like, you know, if, if any, if you're on this call and someone called you and said, hey, tell me about your program, like, how are you not going to want to help? I mean, IP yeah. and Advanced Bronc is still in its infancy, relatively speaking. Like, our own, in fact, the whole purpose of the SAB, right, was to grow bronchoscopy. You know, bronchoscopy is not meant to be something. You shouldn't have to just come to Chicago to get a procedure. Right, it's, it's always been my mindset when this organization got started. Is you should have to drive to downtown Chicago to get a good procedure. You should be able to get it everywhere, where you live. Patients deserve that. And why in what world would I not want to take what I've learned and give it to anybody else? Yeah, I agree with you 100%. All right, here's another one. How do you manage the relationship with the referring pulmonologist? For example, make sure he or she doesn't feel that you are stealing the patients. I mean, I think we said that earlier. It's more, I'd say, like, we, we want to offer a procedure. I'm not here to become your patient's COPD doctor. I want to do the procedure and, and send them back to you. I think, I mean, also having that dialogue with them. So my partner and I, she, uh, you know, she doesn't do a certain procedure I do. She understands that. She refers to me. She tells her patients that I do this. The same thing when I'm looking at this and I found a patient for her. Um, I said, I don't want, I don't want your patient. I, there's enough of them out there. I want to provide them with something that I do. And what do you think about it? And so if there are, if there's feedback after I've talked to him a bunch, I could either use my nurse or, and just say, yep, order them pulmonary rehab, do this, this, and this, and just leave it at that. But I give them that feedback saying, Hey, I just want to let you know, patient looks great as a candidate. Thank you for sending them to me. Uh, Echo was about a year old. I'm going to repeat that. We're going to get them involved in this, taking care of these on this first step. But um, I have a plan to follow them up post procedure, but they're yours after. All the other times for that acute visits, COPD management, lung cancer screening, all that stuff's yours. I mean, the advantage I have, especially being in an urban environment, is that you know, to get down to my hospital, they had to drive past ten different other doctors, right? <laughs> so you know, they've 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 got a local doc, and and 
they, they, I want them to stick with it, right? And they should, I mean, other than obviously related to this. You know what I think? But that's also, as you're growing a program, all my referral base knows how to get a hold of me, right? They all got my cell phone, they all got my email. Um, you know, you, if you if you want to try to build a referral base, make sure everyone understands you, meets with you, understands that you're not out trying to poach anything from them. You're just simply trying to add to them. If you consider yourself, uh, you know, an advanced bronchoscopist and a very procedurally oriented person, then your goal should be to meet folks and upfront say, I would like to be your group's de facto proceduralist, right? I will do all of your bronchs of any, you know, capacity. I will not steal your patients. I want, I'll do your robots. I'll do your stagings. I'll do you know, whatever, whatever. And I've got several groups that, that I'm not part of their group. But indirectly, I am part of their group, and I do all their bronchs. All right, here's another one. How do you build a competent procedural team to make sure that your cases go smoothly? Yeah, that's a, that's a good one. I have a really good tech um, that I've uh, done, done done all my cases with. And that, I can't speak highly, more highly about some of the uh, Olympus reps that have... Are we still on the call? Okay. Yeah, she just... Em's putting up the uh, SAV uh, yeah. slide. Yeah, so I, I can't talk more highly about the Olympus reps and because they will spend the necessary time training your techs and your staff on how do you size your balloons, how do you graph this out. And so um, really, if you've got a good one there, they are a diamond. And so they will take care of so many behind the scenes things, even when it came to coordinate the AI stuff. I really didn't know what was going on when Julia was my rep coordinating with the radiologist, the IT department. She just said, hey, doc, I need your help on this. Make a phone call and that was it. So really, I would say lean heavy on them because they are eager to help you do this and they want to be, they want you to be successful. I think the best way to build your team around you is to one, have the confidence, you know, you're the leader, you need to have the confidence in what you do and then you need to hire people and then give them the training they need but then give them the freedom they need. If you micromanage, you're not gonna have good staff around you. You gotta go back to the mindset when you were a resident or when you were a fellow, you had people underneath you that you trained and, and worked with, right? You've got a team of people who by definition are interested in this. My four bronchoscopy nurses are the greatest people in the world because they are in, as in love with bronchoscopy as I am. And they have they bring their own skill set to the table. But they're unbelievably, you know, and you've given them that freedom and you've given them that uh, professional courtesy, that, it's not even professional courtesy, it's professionalism, they deserve it. They're their own professionals. And so that's how you build that successful team around you. Because the other thing is, is that when you show that you're doing good work and that you're doing interesting work, that attracts people to your program. The people that wanna come work with you are built like you are, because you're trying to do cool stuff, right? You don't want, you're not looking for lazy. Well, if you're doing lots of advanced bronchoscopy, by definition, you're not lazy. Yeah. And so you're going to keep attracting more and more good people that want to come work with your program, no matter what your program is. And I like that you said at the beginning, Bobby, I think that's what's really cool about valve programs and the, and the capacity behind it. You know, yes, your hospital has to have the capacity to handle the patients, et cetera, et cetera. But this is not something that has to be university based. I happen to be at a university. You happen to be in Mississippi at a non-university. Doesn't matter. Two yeah. large, successful programs purely based on being able to establish a workflow and then the procedural competency and then the management of the patients afterwards. That, that's the secret sauce. It's not about where you live. It's not about what the size of your hospital is, et cetera. All right, we got a few more and then we will wrap things up. Yeah. In, terms of, in terms of HIPAA, how did you get around not having a, to consult and being able to reach out to the patients regarding being a candidate for valves? Well, we don't, I mean, we tried for a week and so we learned not to do it. So now we just reach out to the doc. And so, and they're within the health system, right? And so, and it's in the, um, it's in the report and the, the physicians aren't upset that we've talked to them about it because that's the same as the radiologist calling you and say, hey, there's a lung nodule. And obviously the, the, the whole reason why you have this thing built in with the nuance network is that's already the, the framework to keep it HIPAA clean and all that kind of business. Yeah. Okay, and the last question is, what have been the most successful marketing tactics that have helped the word get out about your program? Ciao. Um, for me, it was um, right away talking to every single one of my referring docs, just letting them know. And then some of it was just a text. Hey, we're doing valves now. Anybody, anybody with an elevated RV, I want to see if you, you know, for valve evaluations. Period. And then, um, but the other thing was. Um, uh, the the web blasting things that we do. Our, our hospital has a 
you know, internet presence like a lot do and, and us adding into that. And then I guess lastly was um, really working with pulmonary rehab programs because you literally take care of one COPD or the, what happens is three weeks later, he's back at rehab and, you know, it's the same group. It's a social circle of sorts and everyone's noticing that Mr. Smith over there has doubled his speed on the, on the, on the uh, treadmill. And they're like, what in the world? And he's like, oh, yeah, I saw that guy and he put these things in me. And then, boom, your phone explodes the next day. Man, I, I took it one step further. I did my patient success story video in pulmonary rehab so everybody in the background could see. <laughs> so it, nice. it was really helpful. So we took that and actually put that on the web to kind of blast it down on the social media site. And um, actually, I guess maybe a small town USA in Gulfport, um, everybody seems to still watch the news. So we just did a brief couple of minute hey, this is what we're launching on the coast and we'll be glad to talk to anybody about it. So nice. that actually went a long way. I think, um, yeah, I agree completely. And just real quick with the screen up there, um, I'll make a personal plug. The talk this Thursday is going to be absolutely incredible. Joe and Mike um, are without a doubt two uh, world premier endoscopists and talking about a really cool tool for those of you that do peripheral bronchoscopy. This is once again, the SAB doing everything it can to make sure that that all of us out here who are doing bronchoscopy are, no matter what your background is, no matter what your training is, are going to be striving towards better excellence and getting exposed to things that you might not have seen. So I'll make a plug for this talk because it's going to be fantastic. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Hogarth. Well, that's it for the questions. So thank you again to Nuance for sponsoring this webinar. And also thank you to Dr. Tellus as well as Dr. Hogarth for the informative talk. And thank you everyone for joining. We hope to see you at more SAV webinars. Thanks, guys. Good to see you, Kyle. Bye. See you, Bobby.